Um, okay, well, I'm going to speak first um, because Lindsay's going to say stuff that's much more politically relevant than I am. I'm just going <laughs> to complain about things. <laughs> so um, she's going to finish with some actually positive uh, statements and I'm just going to moan. Um, well, thank you for coming, whether you've come for me or for Lindsay or both or neither of us. Um, Okay, um, and what I'm going to do is basically summarise uh, the reasons why I wrote the book, what, what the book is about, um, in comparison to some other kind of recent attempts to talk to kind of resurrect feminism. And I think it's important to um, begin with the recognition that there's been a massive resurgence of interest in feminism and questions of women's liberation in recent years, and I think particularly since the um, economic crisis, and I think that they're kind of linked. Um, but particularly in the last few months, there have been a whole series of books um, dealing with a certain notion of crisis within feminism. So a lot of the kind of contemporary feminist books have been a, a, a kind of worry about the direction and the meaning of the term, as well as a kind of attempt to, to reclaim it. Um, so recent books include uh, Natasha Walters, Living Dolls, which has been quite successful, uh, rather too successful, I think, given how uh, limited her, her kind of claims are. Um, Kat Banyard's The Equality Illusion. So a lot of these books are about, um, you know, the, how far left to go there is, really, in terms of various kinds of equality. Um, in a more kind of academic vein, you have Angela Robbie's Feminism Seduced um, and others. There's, there's lots and lots of books lately. Um, however, what many of these approaches lack, I would argue, and I do argue in my book, uh, is the inability to talk about the real C word. <laughs> which is capitalism, obviously. Um, so without structural analysis and, and any real examination of material conditions, um, it, it seems clear to me that feminism is doomed to remain a kind of aesthetic or moral discourse and uh, completely cut off uh, from the reality of economic conditions for women across the world. So why do I say moral or aesthetic? Why am I attacking this uh, kind of feminism? Um, much of the contemporary reaction to a purported kind of hypersexualization of culture, which most people seem to be agreed upon, that we live in this uh, world of, uh, you know, sort of pornified culture and pink for girls and everything everywhere. And um, so, so Natasha Walters book explicitly takes up this kind of, uh, this idea, she uses the, the doll uh, metaphor, well, not really metaphor, she thinks that women, contemporary women are supposed to be like dolls. Um, but to me, this analysis, it's not really analysis, it's just kind of description um, it remains stuck at a kind of um, a certain kind of a level of a kind of horrified disapproval, almost right, a kind of uh, a, a worry about how tawdry sexuality has become. And I'm not saying that there's not uh, that's not uh, true; it's not real. Um, but it's a kind of very limited response in a way. It's almost a kind of immediate, uh, a, a sort of moral response. Um, and I and I think that it runs the risk of creating the fantasy of uh, two cultures of contemporary womanhood, uh, a supposedly working class culture, uncritical. Um, which uncritically accepts a kind of sluttishness, um, as opposed to the image of a more restrained middle-class girl or woman who may have lots of sex and write about it, like all of these blimmin' sex blogger type people, um, but is somehow classier than the kind of girl or woman who, who um, gets trashed in the town centre on a Friday night, as if that weren't also a middle-class pursuit in, in Britain. Um, on a recent episode of the Review Show, what used to be a Newsnight Review, um, they had it was devoted to feminism, and they interviewed Natasha Walter and Martin Amis, that well-known expert on <laughs> feminism. <laughs> um, they, um, Kirsty Walk, the presenter, um, held up a padded bra for a nine-year-old as evidence of the decadence of our sexualized culture, in the same way that anti-feminists might once have held up a picture of a woman in trousers. Something has gone terribly awry with the way we picture little girls in particular and the women they will all too soon become. I think it's incredibly easy to be m moralistic about se early sexualization, um, and indeed this was the avenue taken by the guests on the show, rather than looking at kind of more kind of economic or structural uh, kind of explanations. So, I mean, this isn't going to surprise you that she had this response, but the novelist, uh, she's probably a crap novelist, I've never read any of her novels, but uh, the sister of uh, Boris Johnson, the mayor, uh, Rachel Johnson, took this, this bra for nine-year-olds, uh, to be a sign of a specifically working class kind of problem, this is her quote from her, mm -hmm. I don't see middle class mothers going to Primark and buying padded bras or thongs for their nine year olds. <laughs> On the same review show, Zoe Margolis, uh, author of the blog and book Girl with a One Track Mind, could very easily, despite being kind of, you know, happy to be portrayed as this kind of, you know, ex uh, sort of hedonistic, super sexualized woman, could very easily agree with uh, Natasha Walters, rather more sort of middle class restrained. Um, prudish, de prudish demolition of the secularization of contemporary culture, despite extolling the virtues of string-free sex, um, because I think she shares the middle-class assumption 
that working class girls and women are not free to choose their own sexuality. So it's as if this idea that working class women are somehow duped into uh, this kind of hypersexualized, pornified culture, either through their own stupidity or their dire economic circumstances, whereas these kind of middle class sex bloggers are somehow in control and emancipated and empowered by their sexuality. And this, this kind of hypocrisy uh, is kind of the mainstream discourse on feminism, it strikes me, even, if it, even in its supposedly self-critical mode. Um, feminism, though, if, if it is reduced to a discussion about what women wear or other cultural elements, will remain forever ghettoised and reactionary. Um, and part of the reason I think that Natasha Walter is so self-critical in her new book um, is, is partly because of her earlier celebration of Margaret Thatcher <laughs> as a feminist icon. In a sense, she absolutely deserves to feel ashamed of her earlier kind of 90s Spice Girls um, feminism. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it, it's clear, uh, increasingly clear, that we should give up on the fantasy that having the odd token woman in power has anything to do with feminism, right? They can, you know, as we have seen, um, they can easily be, uh, if not m worse, you know, if not worse than men, uh, they can easily be warmongers and, and belligerent. It, you know, they're very useful to have as these kind of token uh, um, images or decoys, as uh, Zilla Eisenstein descri describes them which is a better word than token in a way, decoys, they, they kind of, they lead you into the assumption that, uh, you know, feminism has somehow succeeded because, you know, Condoleezza Rice and is, in, uh, is in the White House. Um, only in lifestyle feminism completely detached um, from any awareness of work and the changing face of exploitation could be so narrow-minded. Um, historically, one of the problems with feminism, I think, or the way it's perceived, um, has been a kind of, kind of uh, the way in which debates get polarised around single issues. So, for example, pornography, uh, you know, it's either you're either kind of pro-porn or anti-porn, uh, without seeing the bigger picture, as if these things took place, in, you know, outside of the economy or outside of history. Um, and again, I would say economic questions get often get reduced to moral or aesthetic uh, um, choices. So what is the bigger picture? I mean, I'm standing here, you know, attacking everyone else, but what, what is the actual bigger picture I'm talking about here? I think that Lindsay German is right in, in her book, in um, wherever it is, <laughs> Material Girls, uh, Women, Men and Work, to focus precisely on the question of work and the economy as a key to understanding what contemporary feminism is up against and to move away from these kind of ghettoised and rehashed debates. And feminism is often doomed to repeat its own history. It often returns to debates whilst forgetting that they happened 20 years before and 20 years before that and so on. Um, in my book, I focused quite briefly, it's a kind of polemic, really, um, on the link between the demand to be a good worker as well as constantly advertising oneself, OK? So that, so that the, this, uh, this kind of pressure to be a kind of sexualised being, to be presentable, to be kind of, you know, networking and selling oneself, um, I think it has to be understood less as a kind of sexualization of culture, but more about the kind of sexualization of the economy, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, um, what you're doing there really is presenting yourself as a good worker, as a kind of flexible worker, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of more important demand, the more important imperative. Um, as women now make up the majority of the workforce for the first time in America, and obviously women in Britain have been, women have worked in Britain for a very long time, um, <laughs> The latest economic crisis is sometimes referred to as the man session due to the um, amount of men uh, proportionally losing their jobs. Okay, so we have this kind of, you know, almost complete, uh, well, yeah, total immersion of, of women into the, the workforce. Um, I think it's important to look at the reasons why <coughs> women might uh, nowadays be seen as better suited to the world of work than their male counterparts, okay? Um, and I think we should be absolutely cynical here. Uh, certain strands of feminism have long touted women's inclusion as a wor in the workforce as an, un as an unalloyed good, as if the exploitation that is part of selling one's labour power would, would certainly melt away or suddenly melt away if there are more women involved. Okay? I think feminism has often been very, very uncritical about work, you know, simply seeing as a kind of break from the kind of shackles of motherhood. Clearly that's true uh, to a large degree and historically incredibly important, but I think the same cynicism that we should have about uh, uh, culture and sexualization of culture, we should apply to uh, the world of work and the way in which women are exploited uh, differentially uh, across the workforce. Um, so just think of the relation between you know, the middle class woman who pays the, somebody to look after her kid while she goes off to work. Um, you know, there's a kind of, you know, tons of internal kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, problems with, within that kind of uh, the world of women in work, the inclusion of women in work. Um, we know that one of the best things about women, from an employer's point of view, is that they're less likely to get uh, that you're likely to get away with paying them less for the same amount of work 
even if you run the risk of having to deal with maternity pay at some point down the line, and very few jobs actually even get to that point anymore. Um, we know that women are apparently less likely to demand promotions. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. But I think it's precisely this fear of reproductions, one element uh, in the kind of economic uh, contradictions, the way it can't deal with certain sort of basic things. Um, so this fear of reproduction, even as capitalism depends upon a future workforce to sustain itself, obviously in the long term it needs more people, but in the short term it's not really prepared to deal with them. Um, and I think it's this fear of, of how you, you deal with that contradiction, or the impossibility, as capitalism sees it, of how, how you deal with that contradiction, um, that lies behind some of the increasing demand that all workers, but especially women, be absolutely f flexible, absolutely ready for work at all times, and definitely not in the position of demanding such arcane things as pensions, sick leave, or job security. Um, I talk a bit in my book, um, because, uh, partly because I was thinking about it from a kind of younger woman's perspective and, and uh, looking at my students, um, and the kinds of work that they have to do uh, to, oops, to uh, pay for their studies um, and the kind of, uh, <coughs> I suppose, shift in types of work available. Um, so I look quite a lot at job agencies, um, you know, where you sign up and you get sort of sent out to different places. Um, some of them, like Office Angels, uh, are, as the name indicates, are often explicitly marketed to women and they're quite pink and shiny and, you know, sort of girly. Um, and they, they sell flexibility as a kind of emancipation, as if there was something sexy about not being able to work in more than one place for 13 weeks for fear that the company would have to give you a statutory week off. Um, and I think what I try to discuss is a, kind of, a new kind of feminised subject, um, which, is, uh, which applies to men and women, actually. Uh, it's not, it's not this, I'm not trying to make a kind of essentialist claim here at all, um, but it's a kind of feminisation of labour and a feminisation of the search for labour, which is what I talked about. Um, okay, so this new kind of feminized subject promoted by this need for an increasingly immaterial capitalism. And she is precarious, flexible, badly paid, but somehow supposed to be loving it, accompanied by Diet Coke and low-calorie chocolate. Mmm, <laughs> all that thing. Okay, so all human decisions, all decisions that are actually quite serious, what well, one would hope, <laughs> um, cohabitation or marriage, pregnancy and so on, are pushed into the private realm, so even things like IVF. So, you know, in the 70s you had Shulamith Firestone predicting a kind of social revolution come IVF, uh, and now we know that it's really the most kind of privatised uh, uh, thing, really. Um, so all of these kind of serious decisions are pushed into the private realm at the same time as these facts are used to pit, uh, pitch workers against one another. Why should I have to stay late to cover her work just because she has a kid in school? Right? So employers are very good at pitching, um, pitting uh, women of different ages against one another, so the childless worker and the, the, the worker with kids, um, as opposed to allowing people to see that we may have more in common <laughs> than, than that. Um, the blurring of life and work, which I talked about, the constant demand to be on call, um, you know, this idea that your company has your mobile phone, they can ring you up whenever you want, you're supposed to answer emails in your spare time, all of this kind of thing, right? Lots of, lots of people have talked about these kind of changes to work, you know, that the, that the old model, the Fordist model of the 9 to 5 job is, is kind of almost completely gone, not least because Britain and other countries barely have any industry left anymore. So everyone is kind of more or less pushed into this kind of position of... Uh, being a kind of pre precarious, flexible worker who's kind of constantly on demand and has to constantly be um, be presentable. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to write bi bad things about companies on your blog <laughs> because you'll get immediately fired and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so this kind of blurring. There's a constant demand to be on call, to use your personal assets, be they physical or intellectual, in every dimension of your role as a good worker means that it's no surprise that young women in particular feel called upon to appear as eager, eager as possible, in a way. And they're encouraged to do so, I think. Um, schooling for young women, it, you really you get this idea, which is great on one level, that you can do anything and be anything, um, but on another, it's also kind of setting uh, uh, young women in particular up for this kind of, uh, you know, super flexible, you know, precarious kind of life. You know, th there's no expectation of a job for life there anymore, um, for men and for women, really. Um, Okay, so where, where once it may have been to impress a man, this kind of eagerness, now it is impre to impress the e economy. Uh, contemporary female subjectivity is a contradictory thing, of course, uh, but I think that contemporary feminism needs to see things like sexuality in the light of women's role, increasing wo role in the workforce, and to recognise that what has been marketed as freedom by job agencies and, and so on is really only <coughs> another form of oppression, 
only more successful because it's women themselves who are carrying out their own exploitation. We need to recognise that contemporary notions of womanhood are directly tied into what the economy seems to demand. Whenever women become unnecessary again, they'll be positioned less as perky young workers and more as demented harpies or housewives. Okay, and we know that if you look back at the you know, images and representations of, of women, particularly after World War II, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of massiveness of the, the propaganda campaign to, to, to get women to see themselves as not as workers but as homemakers and the kind of, you know, the depression that ensued after women had this sort of taste of work, um, you know, and then said, no, 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 you're actually like this. Um, you know, and we know that at other points in history, women are treated as kind of, you know, hysterical, permanently ill creatures who can barely stand up without falling over and, you know, pregnancy is a terrible sickness. You know, and we're in a kind of contemporary mode in which women are supposed to be pragmatic. They're supposed to be the sensible ones. You know, they're the one who look after their kind of, you know, slightly wayward boyfriend and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so, I mean, the point there is just to look at these things in kind of, you know, a sort of... Uh, period way, you know, like why, what, if, why is it useful uh, for women to be uh, to, to be held up in certain ways at different points in history? Um, I think, it, although this isn't a total phenomenon, it seems clear to me that the world economy is turning uh, increasingly towards immaterial and service work. Okay, and service work, I mean, in the broadest possible sense. Okay, we know that you know people still make stuff in factories. I'm not claiming that all work or all products have suddenly become you know spirit uh, <laughs> spirit objects. Um, you know, and, and this has frequently often been the kind of work associated with women. So caring, uh, work, uh, work that involves emotions, work that involves uh, ling linguistic capacity and so on, um, all of those things. Um, there is a tendency for work to become increasingly like that I um, in the West and elsewhere. Um, to finish with a quote from Marx and Engels on this point, that they say, the less the skill and exertion of strength implied in manual labour, in other words, the more modern industry becomes developed, the more is the labour of men superseded by that of women. Okay, this is from the Communist Manifesto, and it's quite an overlooked point in a way. Um, you know, and we know that that's kind of, you know, increasingly the case. If in America, you know, there are more women than men in the workforce, that work itself is becoming uh, less about industry, less about manual labour, but more about kind of communication and information. Um, then this kind of spectre of the kind of the, the perky, flexible female worker comes to stand in for the worker as a whole. Um, the point of communism, they say, is to, quote, to do away with the status of women as mere instruments of production. And I think that contemporary feminism, too, should also be wary of thinking um, that to become an instrument of production is a mark of emancipation. Okay. Yeah, I, I suppose it's very important to look at women and class in a global context, you know, because precisely, you know, we know that there are kind of... Uh, there are ways of being exploited at work, but there are also ways in which, you know, like you bring people over from the developing world and exploit them too. You know, so the middle class woman uses some of her wages to pay for the nanny to look after the kids and so on, right? And, you know, <laughs> if, if, if women in the West stop having uh, very many children, then you can just bring in people from other parts of the world uh, whenever it's economically viable to do so and then play off racist rhetoric whenever you decide to, you know, that the, the economy won't support it. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say, you know, Feminism and class has to be seen in that global context, precisely how we depend upon other uh, uh, people and other women in other parts of the world, you know, and, and the way in which women are often, you know, sort of in a way economically forced to leave their families in order to take care of other people's families, um, uh, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, what I, the reason why I suppose I try to focus on changes to work, and I agree that they're not, you know, they're not total, and I, you know, it's not like there's been this kind of extreme shift to this kind of completely new work. Um, but what I was, I suppose, I was thinking of was that uh, what what people often refer to as proletarianisation. Um, we know that in the 20th century, the the massive inclusion of women in the workforce um, corresponded to a depression in men's wages, real wages. So that basically, what that means is that women were entered the workforce at the same time, precisely because men's men's wages were also depressed. Um, you know, in order to kind of uh, you know allow for an overall like decrease in the amount of money people got. I mean, the 50s fantasy was that you know you'd have one breadwinner, the the, the guy. Um, you know, and he would be able, his wage would be able to uh, fund a wife and a family, right? And now almost nobody has this fantasy. I mean, even in so supposedly middle class cohabiting couples or married couples, you know, the, the expectation is that both partners would will work, even if they have children. You know, that the, the wages as a whole have been depressed. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm precisely not saying, I hope, <laughs> that, you know, I'm only interested in kind of, you know, what students do in their holidays or something like this. I mean, because what I'm saying is that, you know, this kind of overall, uh, 
the ideology of flexibility and and you know precariousness is what's permeating work, the workforce as a whole. You know, it's it's not something that only affects uh, middle class or working class women. It's a kind of it's the it's the the sort of rhetoric of our time. You know that everyone, no one is allowed to expect you know pensions. No one is allowed to expect you know any any benefit really. You know, even if you look at the the, the rhetoric of kind of. Um, uh, Unemployment. No one's allowed to be unemployed anymore. Everyone's a job seeker. You know, like everyone is supposed to have this utterly perky kind of, you know, constantly on tap, you know, relation to work. You know, uh, you're supposed to be networking and you know making contacts at, at every level, really. Um, so I hope I didn't, you know, try and make too much of a split there. I, I you know, I certainly agree with with what uh, Lindsay's saying. Um, on the just on the question of sex. I mean, the porn is bad. Porn of sex is bad. Sex is good. Um, I mean, I suppose, in a way, you know, what I try to say in my book is, is you know, uh, well, I mean, that just that if you get a wiser debate, as, as, you know, as if it's just about those things, if it's just about pornography outside of a kind of political, you know, context, it, 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 it just kind of, it's just going to go back and forth forever and ever and ever. I mean, Ariel Levy, you know, this book is quite an important book and it sort of precedes a lot of the latest... <coughs> kind of feminist resurgence in a way and she's very critical as I am to some extent of a kind of um, very upbeat consumerist feminism particularly American kind of brand of feminism which is all about empowerment and self-improvement and you know this idea that uh, you know pole dancing or lap dancing or whatever is is actually somehow you know a, a, a free expression of sexuality um, you know I don't think many people sort of think that anymore some people still do but um, you know, but Ariel Levy's solution is to return to a kind of, you know, nice, warm, fuzzy humanist notion of sexuality in which if only we could take time to, you know, explore our bodies and talk about our fears. And, and I, I just, I suppose maybe because I'm slightly depressed or nihilistic, but I just think, you know, I don't know how we can get back to that. I mean, it seems, you know, if you talk to, <laughs> to young people, you know, it, there is a way in which this kind of hypersexualization has almost transformed what it means to think of themselves as a sexual subject, you know. it's And it's not... I don't know, I, I don't want to sound depressed about it, but I don't know how we could just simply say, you know, or oh, we need to be nicer to each other. I, of course I agree, of course we do, you know, of course, it, you know, there shouldn't be this kind of porn fantasy of everyone has to have this kind of machinic sex all the time and, you know, do 59 things or whatever. Um, you know, <laughs> most of us aren't that fit anyway. And, um, <laughs> you know, but I suppose I just have, I have a difficulty, I really, a real, you know, almost like a depressed worry about how you'd get back to that humanist model. I don't know. Sorry, that was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, just quickly on the question of the burqa. I mean, uh, Lindsay's very good on this, but I just want to say um, it has to be understood uh, in, a, in a political context. Um, you know, the, the, the only ways we're allowed to think about uh, Muslim women who wear the burqa or the hijab is either that they're oppressed because some man has told them to do it or that they're being rebellious right that there's no neutral way in which this uh, this uh, 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 thing is is seen and we have to understand like what's the political efficacy of uh, seeing women in this way and you know we know that the, the America funded the Taliban and didn't give a flying fuck about you know women's emancipations when it suited them if you know if they got the Taliban on their side you know and, it, and it's just you have to think about it politically and historically you know what's the kind of hypocrisy involved in creating this kind of you know all this fervor around this garment you know these garments you know this is not a neutral issue this is not a kind of a historical thing that we suddenly all feel like one way or another about the burqa as, as um laurie said you know david aronovitz's ridiculous response like oh you know how does it how am i supposed to feel when i see a woman wearing burqa it's like shut up you <laughs> idiot i mean you know and I suppose, <laughs> um you know i just i just think any kind of you know supposedly neutral debate about this you know that doesn't recognize that the usefulness of the ideology around the, and the record is, is just null and void and plays into the hands of of, of fascists um okay uh there's some more stuff about sex oh i don't know i don't want to say anything about it um <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, burlesque. Burlesque. I don't know. It's just a kind of you know, supposedly middle class version of, of of you know what working class women are supposed to do badly or something. I don't know. I just, I mean, you know, there may be a role for kind of witty and funny sexuality, but probably not in this culture. Um, maybe I don't know. I mean, it would be nice if it were true, but I, I suspect it's it's not as kind of you know funny and clever as as it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of it. That's fine. <laughs>